may have been posted online. When Steve asked me what I was going to talk about today, I gave him a talk title, I gave him a summary, and all week long I've been hounded that that's not the right talk for today. So, I allow spirit to move and breathe through me. And so today's talk, you'll notice, it says, change is evolution of consciousness. What you don't know about me yet is that I am called to speak to what is in our present moment awareness. To me, ministry is about speaking to where I and others are on the journey. It's about authenticity as we grapple with issues, spiritual concepts, and what is alive in the room at this moment. Unity of Richmond it behaves as a family system because we're really a small community. Some of you may have heard of John Bradshaw. He's a famous author and family therapist. He's written a book entitled The Family, and he goes into depth about family dynamics and refers to them as family systems. He uses the term system to mean that families have laws, components and structural dynamics and that the whole is greater than the parts. Therefore, family systems change or transform in some way when a member leaves or enters into the system because it forces the other family members to shift. I want you to imagine one of those hanging mobiles, you know, the ones that are like over the baby's crib. If you change one of those pieces, what happens? The entire mobile shifts, doesn't it? Yeah. So here in this community, as Reverend Tony left, there's been a shift. And then new members joined. Guess what? That caused another shift in the system. And then we had Reverend Patricia, the Brock speaking, and now here I am entering into this community. And guess what? We're in the middle of another shift. As long as we are in this process of getting to know each other, discovering who I am as I discover who you are, we are in the midst of transition. And during transition, the overriding feelings often gets distilled into the ideology that, oh my gosh, everything is changing around us. Change brings many of our fears up to the surface. Perhaps in our community, we're focused on particular issues. You know, maybe it's like, we gotta find our new minister, or what's up with those new board members, or deciding what type of music we have to have for our Sunday service. You see, human nature believes that if we see these issues as challenges and we solve them, then all will be well in our community. But as you and I both know, it's never really about the perceived challenge. As humans, we are very, very clever in disguising things into situations to dilute what is at the core. We focus on what is the perceived issue. It may create feelings of frustration or blame or being just feeling uncomfortable. And some of us may even think, you know what, if I say enough affirmations, it will get better. And sometimes it does. But the question remains, have we changed at our core so that the next time we are able to respond as opposed to reacting to? Whatever the situation that is currently concerning us, we may give power to a person, a place, an ideology by our own thoughts, our own interpretations and feelings as we experience another person's behaviors. Now notice, I'm talking about behaviors, not the person. And I'm making this distinction because we know that each person is of God. Although sometimes they or ourselves, we may forget who and what we are, what they are. And from our humanity, our personality, our ego, we tend to focus on the slights and sordid words. 
It can be something as simple and small as, well, why wasn't I invited or asked or offered or given? It's not fair. Or it could be something as big as hearing blame from others for the conditions of our life or in our community. There's a quote from Emily Cady that I want to share with you. I know you just did Lessons in Truth, but I think this is a powerful statement. Remember that all envy and all jealousy are in the human or mortal mind. And that in reality, you, you are an absolute necessity to God in order to make the whole perfect. Isn't that powerful? Yeah, I think so. But if we are unaware of our truth in that moment, or that our buttons may have been pushed, it's very easy to opt to be defensive and duke it out with them. But if we stay centered in love, in truth, in oneness, we get to make choices. Do we engage at the level of impulse reaction or do we choose to operate differently from our highest self? This awareness of change and how our underlying fears cause people to behave strangely really became clear to me about five years ago when my grandmother died. And I have a picture of Gran, I, I call her Gran. And this is her, this is my mom's mom. And this is a picture of her about a year and a half before she died. Gran was this amazing light. And even as she was in the process of dying, she waited for every family member to arrive so that she could have closure before she released this plane of existence. And as my Gran was in the process of dying, our family, I was so impressed by them. We were all connected. Members easily made time for everyone to have personal time and connection with my gran. And we listened to each other. However, the moment my gran died, there was an immediate fight for power and authority. So here's the, the challenge, the presenting situation. A family member displayed behavior such as rigidity, control, blame and disregard. And as this person's animosity grew, it became really clear that I would not be included in my grandmother's funeral plans or in the service. And I was, to be honest, I was heartbroken. But before my grand died, she made one request of me. She had this bird, this interesting little bird and I say little, and I'm using it as a euphemism because this was her baby. She asked me to care for her baby. And this is a sulfur crested cockatoo. It's the largest of the parrots. And he's huge. And he was in the cage the whole time because my grandmother was 89 when she passed. She didn't have the ability to train him. So he was a pretty intense... Um, talk about wanting the cup to pass. It would have been my request for this bird. But I, I told her I would. And so my husband and I, we, we figured out um, what we would do is we would leave the day after Gran died. And what we would do is we would drive the bird back from Florida to Kansas City. And the funeral plans were already made and it was supposed to be held the following week, at which point then I would fly back. So my husband and I, we canceled our existing return flights home and we rented this really big SUV that could actually fit this huge birdcage in. And after we did all of these plans, we then had a call from this person. And they said, Change of plans. The funeral is going to be in a couple of days. Now, how do I consciously handle this situation? Because that's the question. There were lots of unhealthy ways and words that I could have used to react from. I'm sure some of you can relate to that. 
and I decided to do it differently. What I did is I decided that I've got all of these principles and all of these tools, right? The first thing I did was I breathed and it's, it's not those shallow breaths. It's those big, deep breaths, because what that does is it stops the adrenaline from hijacking your amygdala. And then what I did is I talked through the facts several times and not pro from the place of relishing the slights and sordid words, but from a place of getting clarity on what am I feeling? I listened to my own internal dialogue. What meaning am I making of this? And next, I give myself permission to feel all the feelings that come up. Feelings such as shock, anger, hurt, and then fear. Notice in this scenario, fear is a natural feeling when we are in the midst of change. Change is defined as to become different, to become altered, to become transformed or converted. And while the concept of change can be seen as positive, unconsciously, our persona, our humanity resists change. It resists because it's the fear of the unknown, fear of what this change means to us, fear of how this change affects us. Our persona tends to be hyper vigilant and perceives change as a possible threat or death of what we have known as our own personal world. And what do you think human nature's response is to a perceived threat? Well, the response is really primal. It's instinctive. And that's where we get that fight, flight, or freeze. And the action depends on the assessment of the threat. But here's the thing. I want to share this with you because I think it's really important. The fear, whatever we're feeling, the anxiety, the anger, all of that is covering up the needs I or you have. The need to belong, to be included, and to know that I matter. You see, finding out what our needs are, it's crucial. It's crucial to this process. And if you find yourself in interactions with people and the feelings of fear, anxiety, or anger, frustration come up, don't try to rid yourself of the feeling or refuse to feel it because this is where the gold is. Because anytime you feel those feelings, it reminds you that there is a hidden need you have. There's an unmet need you have. And once you uncover your needs, then the healing can begin. And this is where our Christ consciousness and all that time that we spend in prayer and meditation comes into effect. This is where I'm reminded of the truth of what I am. You see, the more times we touch the stillness and connect with our divinity, the easier it is for us to remember and then know and honor our truth. If we choose to be awakened, then we know that there are more options than our humanity could ever understand. We can then choose to await the answer that will give us our best options for the highest and best outcome. And in this scenario, while I was awaiting the answer to my dilemma, it gave me a moment to pause and to look at this family member in a new way from this present moment awareness, I could see them choosing to act from a place of fear. And guess what? This allowed me to now have compassion for them, even while I was being excluded from being part of my grandmother's funeral. The healthy choice became apparent and it happened really quickly. The answer was it was for me to leave before my grandmother's funeral. The decision didn't come from a place of revenge or punishment or primal response. The decision came from what would serve myself 
my husband Graham, our two dogs, and this big bird, Coco. Keeping my promise to my gran about taking and caring for Coco meant that we would have to drive from Florida to Kansas City. And we had a limited time frame to get this bird back home because the season was changing and birds are really sensitive to that. We were at peace. We had said our goodbyes to Gran during her hospital and hospice day. And we did it in a loving and authentic way. In unity, one of our principles is that we are co-creators. And while I know that this is true, I also know that stuff, life happens. But it is how we respond and the choices we make to that stuff. That is what is the mark of an awakened co-creator. So why do you think I've chosen to tell you this, this life story of mine? Because in this church community, the dynamics are such that unity of Richmond East Bay operates as a family system. And I hope by sharing my journey, I've shared some tips and tools to help you navigate with members of this community. Because as things continue to change here, our fears could show up in numerous situations. Therefore, I wanted to remind you, it is mostly never about the situation. Think about what's happening here in this community and draw the parallels to my family situation. Because of the change in my family dynamics, it brought up many of our fears. Fears of how will we fit into our family system without my grandmother? She was the matriarch. Fears regarding what roles would we want to take on as power shifts. Fears regarding our importance to other family members. You see, my story simply mirrors the transition going on here at Richmond. The choice you have now is to look at your roles in this community and to discern how to respond as changes continue to occur here you can determine if the situations that are arising now are about your personal fears becoming magnified and what you choose to do about them. I'm suggesting that as we go through this, that we be compassionate with each other because we're in a growth on this journey. And many of these situations allow us to shift, to co go, come up higher in consciousness so that we can rise above our fears and misunderstandings. We get to truly trust in our divinity. Knowing the truth of what we are is spirit-filled love. We get to stand in our authenticity and in our power as we welcome these new changes. Now, in case you're thinking, how am I supposed to remember everything that Rev Cherie said today? Well, I got you covered because here's a synopsis of the steps. I call this my five steps for sanity. And so if you choose to use them, I think it might be beneficial. Right? The first thing is that we breathe and taking those deep breaths, that's what stops the hijack from happening. That emotional hijack as the adrenaline is pumping through our system. So you want to be able to do that. And then we look at the facts, right? We look at what are the facts of the situation? What's, what's the story then I'm telling myself about the facts? And what are those feelings that are coming up from those thoughts and those interpretations? and allow yourself to feel the feelings. And as you're feeling the feelings, then allow yourself to identify what are your hidden needs? What are you, what are you in need of? What, what need is not being met? And then before you react, before you send the email, before you do the text, before you pick up the phone and make the phone call, before you make the snide remark, because all of those are coming from our reactions. 
await the answer from your highest self, from source. And then you get to shift consciousness, one person at a time, as you respond and walk your talk. So that's my, my wish for this community. And I'm hoping that you will take those five steps into your consciousness this week and really allow it to guide you in your interactions with each other. I thank you for listening. I thank you for your attention. And why don't we prepare for meditation? Steve is going to play us a Daniel Namod song to get us set up for meditation. <laughs> 